Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy you could be with us. My name is Tamara Bingham Noyes. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Center for Change. With me is Quinn Nystrom, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. We're so happy to have Quinn with us. It's been a while since we've had a webinar with Quinn, so we're thrilled to have her back. Uh, I want to go over just a few um, housekeeping items really quickly before we get going so that we can get Quinn right into her presentation. So a couple of things. First of all, a copy of the PowerPoint is in the handout section of the toolbar. Obviously, you're going to see Quinn's PowerPoint up on the screen as she goes along. But if you'd like to download that, then you can click on the PowerPoint in the handout section and download that for further reference in the future. It's also located on the webinars page of our website. So if you need to get it later and you pop out and you're like, oh shoot, I meant to download that, feel free to go to our, um, our, our webinars page on our, on our website and you can get it there. Uh, also in that uh, handout section is a copy of the post test. You're welcome to keep an eye on that throughout the presentation so that you can know what questions are coming your way. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a minute, but that post test is just a read only. You have to take the test online in order to get CE credit. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but know that you can reference that post test throughout Quinn's presentation so you can keep an eye on those test questions. You're welcome to submit questions in the questions section of the toolbar. We'll try to get to a few at the end of the of the webinar. So there are a lot of you on here, so it's difficult to have folks unmuted and on camera. There's just too many. So in order to ask a question, if you'll just type that into the question section of the toolbar, I'll keep an eye on those throughout the presentation. And then at the end, we'll circle back to some of those and get to uh, as many as we can. When the webinar ends, there will be an evaluation that will automatically pop up on your computer screen. If you take just a second to complete that evaluation, that would be really helpful. That evaluation is a uh, continuing education requirement for us. Uh, it's completely anonymous, so please feel free to be candid in that feedback. We tabulate those results and send those to the CE entities. So if you take just a second to complete that, that would be wonderful. And then about an hour or so after the webinar is finished, you'll get a separate email from GoToWebinar. It will look similar to the email that you got when you, the confirmation email you received when you registered. It's a separate email from GoToWebinar about an hour after we finish uh, with the link to take the online test. And again, you must take the test online in order to receive continuing education credit. Once you pass the test online, your continuing education certificate is automatically downloaded to your computer. So if you don't see it on your screen, check your downloads file. Sometimes it hides in there and, and you'll find it there. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Quinn in just a second. I want to tell uh, you all a little bit about Quinn. She'll tell you more about herself as she goes along. Quinn is an amazing human to begin with. She's a phenomenal diabetes advocate. She speaks all across the country on diabetes and eating disorders. She uh, works in the political arena to advocate for insulin affordability. Um, she's a wonderful human and we're thrilled to have her with us. She has such a great knowledge of, of diabetes. She lives it and she'll tell you more about that. Um, and she really has a lot to contribute to the field. So we're thrilled to have you with us, Quinn. I'm going to send this over to you. So give me just a second. I'll make you the presenter. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I think I'm showing my start your presentation from the beginning and then we should be good to go. Okay, let me click. There it is. Okay, I'm going to hop off. I'm going to turn off my mic and my camera, but I'm right here. So if you need something, holler, and otherwise I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Okay, perfect. Let me get... All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know uh, we've all been a little... We've all had a little bit of Zoom burnout, I think, over the last year and a half. So really appreciate you um, taking the time. I know we're all busy. A lot of medical professionals I know on this webinar, so thanks for joining. Uh, I'll be very cognizant of the time, and again, I'll leave time at the end um, for any questions or comments that people have on this presentation. So uh, again, my name is Quinn Nystrom, born and raised, live here in Minnesota. The topic that I'm going to be discussing today is diabetes burnout, which I think is really important. Uh, something that is very prevalent in the type 1 and type 2 diabetes community. We're going to talk about what is it, what contributes to it, 
and how can we best treat it uh, when we see signs of it uh, with one of our patients or even with one of our loved ones, um, how best to communicate uh, to a person living with diabetes who's struggling with this. So a very quick background on me, why I'm so passionate about talking about type 1 diabetes. Um, my younger brother, Will, uh, who's pictured here, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of five. Uh, he was in preschool at the time. We had no family history of the disease. Uh, I was 10 years old at the time. I'm in the, the yellow uh, shirt with a pink star. I was in the fifth grade. I knew when Will was diagnosed and hospitalized, I made a promise to him that I would do whatever I could to help find a cure for diabetes and do anything I could to help improve his life. And so it's really been a life mission of mine. And so it's a real honor to be presenting um, here with you today. Um, but when Will was diagnosed, you know, my mother, who was sort of the primary caregiver, because my father worked, you know, 60 hour weeks, he owned his own business. Uh, my mom was really in charge of Will's diabetes care giving him, you know, insulin injections multiple times a day, doing his finger pokes, uh, his blood sugars. Uh, she also, for my myself and my older sibling, Thor, uh, you know, she had all of us change our diet. So we took out sugary cereals, we took out sugary drinks. You know, it's really a family disease. Um, and so a lot of things changed for all of us, but obviously most of all to Will. Uh, here's me at 13. Uh, I, I think they used to call me metal mouth, right, with those braces. Uh, I, I have a teenager now, actually, who has braces, and I'm always like, oh, it's a tough time. But uh, so when I was 13 years old, um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So just two and a half years after Will, uh, it certainly was a struggle because as a 13-year-old girl, all I wanted to do was fit in. Um, I really only cared about guys. Uh, I wanted to just blend in as much as possible, talk like my friends, look like my friends. And now I was being diagnosed with a disease I never thought I'd be diagnosed with because Will had it. And that doctor at the time said to my parents, there is no likelihood that your two older children could get type 1 diabetes. It's impossible. Well, I think a lot of us know on this call, it's not impossible to have a couple children in a family with type 1 diabetes. It may be more on the rare side, but it certainly happens. So I was shocked. I was devastated. I was crushed. I was embarrassed. Um, and I really struggled with the disease tremendously uh, for over a year um, until my mom sent me to a diabetes camp, which ultimately really helped me change my perspective on living with the disease. Um, okay, I got to move this toolbar so that I can read my own presentation. Um, so I really love this. And William Polanski, Bill, is a leader. So if you want to learn more about diabetes burnout, if this topic that I'm presenting today really piques your interest, I would Google uh, William Bill Polanski. He's out of California. Um, he's been a real pioneer on the topic of diabetes burnout, um, has a lot of great material studies. I believe he's written a book about it. Um, and so he says, when you are diagnosed with diabetes, it feels like the universe has just handed you a new job with no pay and no vacations. If you're going to manage it, it takes effort and vigilance. That's why it's this balancing act. And I think that's a great way to put about, again, I can only speak personally to type one diabetes, but every single day of my life, I'm having to check my blood sugar or make sure you know the continuous glucose monitor is working correctly. I have an insulin pump. Um, I have to make sure that the infusion site is working properly and that I'm getting insulin. And then when I'm eating, right, that um, I'm getting the proper dose for the food that's coming into my body, figuring out how exercise affects my blood sugars. So there's just so many sort of things up in the air. Um, it's, it's truly a balancing act and it's a disease where you don't get a day off and you don't even get an hour off from it. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard that feedback from your patients. So what is diabetes burnout um, as I'm sort of discussing here? So um, the way that it is uh, described, I'm sorry, I'm having problems with this uh, key thing, uh, a state of mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion following an apathetic detachment from one's illness. Um, I, 
I'm sorry, with this toolbar, um, identity, uh, diabetes, self-care behaviors, and support systems, which is commonly accompanied by a feeling of powerlessness. Um, again, it's it's sort of a combination. It's a, it's a holistic sort of on all parts of you are just feeling run down um, and that you've kind of come to a breaking point. Uh, there is a way that you can actually diagnose diabetes distress. Again, William Polanski is the one um, who created this distress scale. It's 17 questions, again, one through six. So one not a problem, six a very serious problem. Um, here's just a couple of uh, the questions, but you know, like feeling that diabetes is taking up too much of my mental and physical energy every day feeling that my doctor doesn't know enough about diabetes and diabetes care, feeling angry, scared, and or depressed when I think about living with diabetes. And then there's sort of four areas of scoring at the end, which is emotional burden, uh, physician-related distress, regimen-related distress, and interpersonal distress. Um, but a really good um, tool um, that I see is being used more and more in the medical community. So what contributes to it? Um, you know, how does somebody get um, to be, you know, burnt out from living with this chronic incurable illness? Well, I think certainly to some of you on this call or webinar, uh, you'll know why people get very burnt out from living with this. So, you know, this is just a picture. Uh, I love this little bag because it says this bag contains my pancreas. But this is the stuff that I regularly have to have with me on a regular basis. I can't just, I remember being a 13 year old girl after being diagnosed, I wanted to go to the movie. Just going to a movie for two hours with friends had to be a whole ordeal. Or going to my very first sleepover after I was diagnosed was a huge deal, huge coordination with the parent who was hosting, what food would be served, how I would get my insulin, how I would dose it. Um, but you constantly have to have all these things. You also, and I'll talk more about financial distress later in this presentation, which I think is really crucial in, in this specific topic that we're discussing, but you have to be able to afford all these things on the left um, to keep yourself alive. Um, and that comes with a lot of stress um, and, and distress as we're gonna be discussing here. Uh, 42 factors that affect a blood glucose. If you guys have been on presentations with me before, you know that I love this chart, not because I have to live it and breathe it every day, but I think it gives a really good um, look at that balancing act that Bill Polanski was talking about earlier about, and again, Diatribe came out with this a couple years ago, um, but it's so true, right? So what can affect my blood sugar? You have obviously up arrows mean it'll raise your blood sugar. If it's a side arrow, you know, it'll sort of keep it as is. Down arrow, obviously it will drop your blood sugar. But you have all these different things in the category of food, medication, activity, biological, environmental, behavioral, and decision-making. So throughout the day, I'm trying to keep my blood sugar between 80 and 130. And I have to sort of combat these different factors that are happening. And so, you know, sometimes I'll get sort of a question from a medical provider or a family member like, well, how could your blood sugar be 350? Oftentimes I want to have a printout of this chart, hand it to them and say, well, your guess is as good as mine, but it's one of these 42. You know, sometimes I know why my blood sugar has skyrocketed. Sometimes I have absolutely no idea. Same with low blood sugars. And so um, I, Again, not 100% of people with diabetes have burnout, but I think this is a, a really easy way to understand why we have high levels of people experiencing diabetes distress. Um, I loved this. Uh, this came from actually somebody's blog post. Uh, it was type 1 diabetes mission control. And this woman said, uh, the International Space Station is arguably the most complex machine ever built by man, uh, coming in with a cost of $100 billion. But type 1 diabetes is one of the most complex to di diseases to understand, with no concrete reason for diagnosis. You know, they still can't put their finger on 
why did I get diagnosed? Why did Will, my brother, get diagnosed? And we also have no ultimate cure at this time. This disease uh, costs the United States of America $245 billion annually to treat, to diagnose, um, you know, all the associated costs. And so there's a lot of striking similarities um, between these two. And so again, I think it's a different way to look at the disease itself, um, that it's very complicated, it's very complex. There's a lot of sort of micro and macro things that you are looking at. Um, and again, you know, at 13 years old, I had zero interest of being in the medical field. I could barely pass, you know, high school chemistry. That was, I also hated mathematics. And now, right, I was being given a disease that I had nothing to do with uh, in getting. And I was having to make all these very small calculations to simply keep myself alive every single day. Um, and, you know, I'll admit that in itself burnt me out and it has burned me out several times over my life. I've had type 1 diabetes now for uh, coming up on 23 years and my brother's coming up on 25 years this December. So I did some graduate school research. This was a couple of years ago. Um, this was specifically looking at type 1 adolescents, so from the ages of 10 to 17, um, on communication messages that affect them. Um, uh, I looked at social learning theory with Albert Bandura, right? This perceived self-efficacy is conceptualized as perceived operative capability. So it can kind of be boiled down to social learning theory is one's belief in themselves their self-confidence to execute a very complicated disease, right? So how much confidence do I have in myself that I can keep myself alive with type 1 diabetes and do a halfway decent job? Um, we've seen here that, um, and research has shown us this, right, that scare tactics are effective. Uh, they do not work, but we really need to switch from scaring people to empowering them. And I think the medical community, the diabetes community in, um, uh, in particular, has done an excellent job at trying to switch that narrative. Um, so we looked at, you know, how helpful is your diabetes medical team in helping you with the management of your diabetes? Uh, you know, 15 people said very helpful, 10 said pretty good or fair. Seven responses. Yeah. Camera, I'm hearing some feedback. Is that? Yeah, Quint, I'm hearing it as well. So I'm going to mute everyone. And when I do that, it'll mute you as well. So just hang on for just a minute and then okay. I'll come right back. Okay. Perfect. Mm Hey, Shelly, can you help me unmute Quinn? Hang tight, Quinn. Quinn, see if you can click on your own microphone and if it will unmute that way. Sorry, folks, hang tight. Oh, great. Can everybody there hear me? There we go. Yep, okay, perfect. You're good to go. Thank you for waiting. Yeah, thanks everybody. Wanted to get that figured out so you didn't have to hear that for another 30 minutes or so. Um, so the conclusion of the research was, uh, you know, we were looking at what messages affect a type one adolescence uh, the most when it comes to their self-management of their disease. Um, again, we looked at healthcare professionals, we looked at family members, we looked at uh, teachers, we looked at peers, we looked at the internet. Um, but what greatly affected them the most um, was 75% of people who participated in the research told of a person having misinformation. 
just over 40% reported that they had a negative experience where they were called to overweight. 71% um, said the most motivating factor in improving self-management is curability or controllability. So something that's in their power um, to do. And so what was interesting about the research was, um, you know, I thought that, you know, a negative message would lead to worse um, sort of management of the disease. But that was not what was found. What actually uh, appeared sort of to raise the red flag was this distress on these negative experiences where everybody, um, all of those groups of people had told a person with type 1 diabetes something very negative and something that was outside of their control, calling them overweight, saying that they ate their way to the disease, saying they couldn't eat candy, that um, you know they ate their way into their diagnosis, they could get on a diet and cure themselves that those were actually the most distressing messages. Um, and that even though that caused distress, we didn't see it directly correlated uh, with the self-management, but just seeing the high prevalence um, of those negative experiences on a person living with type one diabetes. Here's another great quote from Bill. Uh, People with diabetes do what anyone else does. Very few of us can follow every single healthy habit or change. So we choose the ones we can. So uh, as a lot of you know, diabetes, again, I'm gonna probably say it over and over in this presentation, is so complex. There's so many moving parts. Um, again, I am not an expert. Uh, you know, I didn't go to medical school. I didn't go to nursing school. I never became a dietitian. I never became a pharmacist, sadly to my father who's a pharmacist. But um, I, I do the very best that I can every single day. Am I perfect on all things? Absolutely not. I I think trying to strive for perfection as somebody with diabetes, uh, you're just going to find that you're going to fail um, because that's the way that this disease is. Uh, you could do everything right and you're going to still find that your blood sugars could be high, they could be low, they could be out of range. Uh, so again, seeing that we're doing the very best job we could. I also want to say, and I usually say this in my presentations, I try to that with this presentation, in no way am I trying to say anything negative about healthcare professionals, um, about support people in a person with diabetes life. I think everybody is doing the very best they can with the information that they have received. Um, and things are constantly changing and evolving. And we're learning more about this disease, just like we learn a lot more about other diseases as the years go on. Um, I know that you guys got into this profession because you wanted to help people. Um, and so I hope today you're just seeing maybe a new perspective or a, a, a perspective that may be added to some stuff that you already knew. So um, when we're looking at sort of mental health, right? So 33 to 50% of people with diabetes will experience diabetes distress at some point. So we're talking in the realm here of diabetes burnout, what leads to that diabetes burnout. We know up to 45% of mental health conditions and cases of severe psychological distress go undetected among patients um, being treated for diabetes. So now you don't just have type one or type two diabetes. Now you're also suffering either from diabetes distress and or other mental health conditions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more um, about that. We also, uh, as people with type 1 diabetes, this is specifically for type 1 diabetes, you are at a higher risk for other autoimmune diseases. So celiac disease, thyroid, MS, lupus, gastritis, um, Addison's disease, um, you know, a couple more there. You know, I know for myself, right, I have type 1 diabetes and I also have gastritis. Um, I also, you know, have mental health issues, like I was diagnosed at 24 with bulimia. So there's not just the type one that is exhausting enough, but now you're adding more things onto that. You're adding more layers, and that's going to cause even more concern uh, for getting yourself to a point of diabetes burnout. So mental health. People living with type one or type two diabetes are at an increased risk for depression, anxiety, and eating disorder. We know rates of depression across the lifespan are two times greater for people with diabetes than in the general population. 
People with type 1 diabetes are twice as likely to live with disordered eating. We know specifically in women with type 1 diabetes, bulimia is the most common eating disorder, while women with type 2 diabetes are more likely to deal with binge eating. And with type 1 diabetes uh, and an eating disorder, you may often hear the term diet bulimia, people who are doing insulin omission. And that certainly is a percentage of people with type 1 diabetes and eating disorders. But I'll say from my own kind of personal story and experience, I never omitted insulin as the purge behavior. Um, I purged by vomiting. Uh, and, and so I always bring that up because I want medical professionals and caregivers to know that there's not just one type of bulimia for somebody living with type 1 diabetes, right? Those symptoms can vary all across the board. Um, it is estimated that only around one third of people with diabetes and mental health conditions receive a diagnosis and proper treatment. Um, you know, and to me, that is just devastating. Uh, we already know the general population here in America, right? How so many people struggle with mental illness and, and they don't get the help they need and they deserve. And we certainly see that here uh, with people with diabetes. And so again, what can we all do collectively to help better treat it, better address it. I have to bring up financial distress. Um, again, this is a real passion of mine. I, I take sort of all my spare time devoted to um, the cause of insulin affordability. So I'll try not to go the next 30 minutes on just this. Uh, I think I have just two slides on this. Um, but if you have questions at the end about this specifically or ever want to email me about it, uh, just know I'm, I'm very passionate about this topic. So diabetes in and of itself is the most expensive health condition in our country. So, and just over 50% of that is just paying for the pharmaceuticals. So insulin makes up about 56% of the overall annual spending I will do on keeping myself alive with diabetes. Um, which again, this statistic is specific for the United States. Um, a lot of you know this, but uh, a, a vial of insulin like Novola costs about $340 retail price here. You go to Canada or most other developed countries in this world, Europe, uh, Mexico, India, uh, you can get that vial anywhere between $20 and $35 uh, US. So we have an extreme problem in this country uh, with the high cost of insulin affordability. So we see 2.3 times greater healthcare costs for Americans with diabetes opposed to a healthy American. 327 billion annual cost of diagnosed diabetes in America. One in seven do healthcare dollars is spent treating diabetes and its complications. Again, that's for all healthcare dollars through the National Institutes of Health. Price of insulin has skyrocketed 12 hundred percent in the past 20 years and again that vial of insulin nothing has changed about it nothing has been improved about it it is the same exact insulin uh, so right when i was diagnosed i used nph and regular uh, this was back in the 90s when will and i were diagnosed a couple years after that humalog came out we started using that along with lantus but those insulins along with novolog they've not changed they haven't gotten better We've only seen the cost increase so drastically, um, uh, which is had a devastating effect with people with diabetes. So 40% of American patients with diabetes report a financial hardship. And this again, right, this is important to know, including patients with health insurance. So uh, for instance, for me, I, I have a decent paying job, you know, probably um, middle income. I ended up getting married to my husband a year early. We, we went to a courthouse to get married so that I could get on his health insurance. I had health insurance as a, a single woman uh, through our state exchange here in Minnesota, but I was paying so much. I was paying over $10,000 a year to keep myself alive. Um, and if I simply married him, uh, you know, about a year early, I would have much better uh, insurance and pay a lot less out of pocket. So again, people can have health insurance and still uh, be completely riddled with debt, with medical costs, with pharmaceutical costs. Uh, we have a lot of 
high deductible plans that really hurt people in this country. 46% uh, of people with diabetes have reported difficulty in affording food, cost-related medication um, uh, underuse, house in, housing instability, energy instability, and poor diabetes uh, control. Uh, I And I have to say this actually just came out here at the end of July. Maybe some of you saw this. The American Diabetes Association released a report that found the, that pandemic homelessness amongst people with diabetes hits 48 times harder than other Americans. And, and this was used um, in a sort of a 10 day span in June of this year. And so we know that homelessness is a determinant of health status. So again, throwing something else on top of already just trying to survive with diabetes. Um, the report included that the efforts of patients and clinicians are insufficient in situations where patients could not afford basic needs. One in two people with diabetes cannot afford or get access to insulin. And as we know, especially for somebody with type one diabetes, if we don't have insulin, we're going to die. We're gonna get very sick very quickly. We also know that there is a lot of people with type two diabetes who depend on insulin to stay alive as well. So we have seven and a half million Americans who depend on insulin every single day to stay alive. And we see that 50% can't afford it. Uh, that is absolutely devastating. Um, only 3% of people globally can afford a continuous glucose monitor. So again, me personally, I wear the Dexcom monitor. Uh, I have it you know, tied to my phone and to my, my Apple Watch. You probably can't see it here. My so my blood sugar is 138 right now. I know that's steady. But again, if somebody can't afford their insulin, they can't afford a continuous glucose monitor. I know that I'm very privileged in order to be able to wear that. And so, you know, I'll I'll give this example, you know, for the Super Bowl this year, people of course were thrilled to see Nick Jonas in a commercial on TV for the Super Bowl. But that commercial was all about time in range. So instead of just looking at someone's A1C, which has long been sort of the predictor of how well you're doing with diabetes, the hemoglobin A1C, there's been a switch to look at time and range. But let's take a step back. You have to have a continuous glucose monitor to be able to look at those numbers. And a continuous glucose monitor, even with my husband's great insurance, I pay over $300 every couple months just to get that supplies on top of what I'm paying for insulin, on top of what I'm paying for medical appointments. And again, we're just talking about my type one diabetes. We're not talking about my therapy sessions, um, any treatment that I've done related to the eating disorder, um, procedures that I've had to have because of the gastritis. So all this stuff is just piled on um, and you can see that a lot of people get to a breaking point. And, and to me, it's no wonder when we're, uh, when we're looking at all of this, um, you know, and I understand in medical appointments that you have a finite amount of time to talk with that person with diabetes. And so oftentimes I think the topic of financial distress with patients can be long and drawn out. Also, it's very personal. So sometimes people keep that very closely guarded um, because I think there's shame, there's embarrassment. You know, in America, it's all about pulling yourself up from your bootstraps, uh, being able to do everything, pay for everything yourself. And so um, it can be very distressing when you know you're not able to afford those basic needs. But I think we also need to educate people in the diabetes community to let them know they're not alone, that a lot of them are in the majority with having to struggle with affording. And it's not about them. It's unfortunately about a corrupt system that we have in this country uh, that we have not been able to, um, you know, sort of uh, wrangle in these high costs uh, through different legislation uh, and different executive orders. So um, I will not continue on with that, but I also want to say um, the organization Diatribe came out uh, and they did a study and it showed statistically that fewer than one in five people with diabetes have A1Cs lower than 7.5. Now, the American Diabetes Association 
for adults 18 and older, they recommend an A1C of 7.0 or lower. For adolescents, that number is 7.5. Uh, so again, for people who don't know, this is a blood test. It, it looks at sort of, uh, you know, your average kind of blood sugars over the last three months. That's how we get to this number uh, for the hemoglobin A1C. But again, we're seeing that we're missing the mark. Most people are missing the mark. And um, I want to say, you know, yesterday I was actually having a conversation with a woman who lives in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's hot, it's summertime. So I had my my pump was showing and also my continuous glucose monitor on, on the back of my arm. And so she asked me if I had diabetes and I said, yes, I do. And she is a lovely woman. And she went on to tell me a story um, about her father and how he's an uncompliant type two diabetic who doesn't care about his health who recently got himself into trouble with a very low blood sugar. The family's very upset at him, expressed their frustrations. And um, in that situation, I always listen. But I will tell you, in my years of, of speaking on this topic to over 300,000 people, I have never met a single person with diabetes who wants to do bad, who wants to feel sick every single day or have a low blood sugar or a high blood sugar. It's miserable. And so typically the person with diabetes is doing the very best job they can with the tools and the resources they've been given or with the lack of. And so, you know, I think if we can work hard to look at people with diabetes with a more empathetic lens, um, and again, I know that this woman is a lovely woman. She didn't mean anything bad about her father, but when I started talking to her about the costs associated with how you never get to take an hour off from this disease, you know, that we just can't go to the doctor's office, get our little insulin treatment, and then return home for the week. That's not how this disease works. Um, she really then started to better understand it. Um, and again, I never do it in a shaming way because I don't think people are meaning it in a mean way. They're uh, you know, it's through the lens of their own understanding of this disease. So how do we best treat somebody who is struggling with diabetes burnout, diabetes distress? So let's look at language. Um, the biggest problem with terms like non-compliant, which again, I hear this term a lot when people know I have diabetes, they want to tell me about a non-compliant person in their life is the impact on the person with diabetes and their motivation and empowerment to improve their health. So when people are termed non-compliant, you know, one reaction you can get is just like, you throw your hands up in the air and you're like, okay, you think I'm non-compliant? Well, what's the point? Or I've heard from people with diabetes who their medical team just sort of has given up. They've said you're non-compliant. They use more of their scare tactics. Now those people with diabetes never want to book another medical appointment. They have such a great fear of seeing any medical professional that they don't want to go in. And so I, I think like uh, Ms. Dickinson, who's done phenomenal work with the use of language in diabetes care and education, you know, she says words have the power to elevate or destroy. This is also true of language referring to persons with diabetes, which can express negative and disparaging attitudes and thereby contribute to an already stressful experience of living with this disease. On the other hand, encouraging and collaborative messages can enhance outcomes. So I can tell you when somebody made me feel safe, uh, made me, uh, you know, be seen and be heard, I'm much more apt to open up to them and, and tell them about my struggles, which are very personal. Um, so, you know, what if we you know, uh, by viewing that the non-compliant patient, instead we looked at it as someone grappling with an obstacle rather than a lazy person, right? What if uh, the person's health insurance won't cover adequate diabetes education? What if they can't get affordable health insurance and are paying out of pocket for every visit? What if they have a severe phobia of needles or swallowing pills, but no one asked that when prescribing insulin injections or oral medications. We know that metformin, which is a very common type two medication, those are some real horse pills. What if they're struggling with depression, anxiety, or diabetes burnout? What if another major life event, like a death, a divorce, childcare, 
Changes in employment is significantly affecting their ability to make diabetes management a priority. I will say for myself in my, in my own life, I have a mother uh, who has been struggling uh, with early Alzheimer's and recently has been diagnosed with dementia. That puts a, a big burden on me. Um, it's very difficult for me emotionally. She's been my best friend. And so again, you're putting something on top of my type 1 diabetes, my gastritis, my bulimia, my anxiety, my depression. And, and now I have one of the most important people in my life suffering. Uh, that's going to cause uh, even more issues. And, and, and we know anxiety and all those different things, those can affect blood sugars. What if the side effects of their medications are unbearable and they've stopped taking them? And they may not have even told you because they're embarrassed. What if they were never educated on the purpose and the value of taking that medication? What if they live in an unsafe home facing daily abuse? What if they don't have the financial resources available to them to afford that basic medication? Right? I think if we can just kind of change our minds and look at things in a different perspective. Um, and again, I can't imagine how difficult your jobs are as medical professionals and knowing what short time windows that you even get to have with patients. So barriers to adherence. So again, I think it's more productive to replace the idea of compliance with the concept of barriers to adherence. So instead of saying somebody's non-compliant, what if you just changed that slightly and said, okay, this person must be struggling with a barrier or adherence. So again, do they have ineffective coping skills? Is there a lack of support from family and friends? I um, mean, actually, I'll be doing a, a, a full webinar on this topic in November. Uh, you can look out for it. I'll be doing it for Center for Change on family dynamics um, with people living with diabetes. Uh, another, I think, really important topic. Um, but again, misconceptions about the disease and its treatment. What did they learn from maybe somebody else, from the media, uh, from a family member? A barrier to adherence can be an inability to understand, purchase, and use medications. Uh, how about poor nutritional choices? Um, again, I could do a whole topic on fat phobia in America. Uh, it's, it's something that I think is, is really devastating. Uh, we really see that shame being brought into the diabetes community, specifically, especially uh, in the world of type 2 diabetes. Um, and so, again, we need to look at, right, are they living in a food desert? What is their access to good and healthy and fresh food? Or is the barrier, again, financial to getting that when they already have to pay for their electricity, their car, um, gas, children, uh, you know, and, and maybe the money that's left over can only buy a box of macaroni and cheese. Uh, lack of availability of better food options, like I just said, an environment that is not conducive to physical activity. Or maybe, again, um, uh, I know a lot of people with diabetes who are working two to three jobs uh, just to try to stay above water. They're not going to have a lot of time for physical activity to go to a gym. Again, think a membership is a barrier. Uh, they're not going to have time to go and work out four times a week. So really looking at things like that. And again, uh, lastly, poor self-efficacy. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, the confidence that they can achieve long-term behavioral change. So, um, you know, I, I've been asked this question before, but can diabetes cause mental illness? So changes in blood sugar can cause rapid changes in mood and other mental health symptoms, such as fatigue, trouble thinking clearly, and anxiety. Having diabetes can cause a condition called diabetes distress, which shares some traits of stress, depression, and anxiety. Again, I think this is always going to go back to that old adage of, uh, was it the chicken before the egg or vice versa? Um, and so, and then at the end of the day, does it really matter? right, if diabetes was the cause of the, the mental illness. Um, I think we can look at just what I've presented today and say, wow, um, I, I'm exhausted just talking about it. Imagine having to live it and constantly being on this tightrope, doing this balancing act. Um, it's very, very difficult. So recommendations. 
when you have a patient like this, when you may have a loved one uh, who's who's suffering from diabetes burnout, use language that is neutral, non-judgmental, and based on facts, actions, or physiology and biology. Use language that is free from stigma. Uh, use language that is strengths-based, respectful, inclusive, and imparts hope. Use language that fosters collaboration between patients and providers. You know, I know uh, an old endocrinologist I had, I, I loved this, that he would always say, he would say, you know, Quinn, I am the coach, but you are the quarterback. I can give you as many plays as possible, you know, from the knowledge that I have as a doctor, but ultimately, you're the one making 98% of your diabetes day-to-day self-management decisions. Um, you know, I'm not around. You see me maybe four times a year, maybe a diabetes nurse educator four times a year, tops, right? That's if you can afford it. Um, and, and so, again, are we really fostering this collaboration? Are we really empowering that person to say, look, you're making those um, tough game day decisions. You're out on the field, oftentimes by yourself. How can we best equip you? And understand that at the end of the day, that person is going to make those decisions. So how can you best support them? Um, and then lastly, using language that is person-centered, um, I think is really, really critical. Um, again, you know, in the graduate school research, I found what was most motivating was not always diabetes itself. So their goal was not to have better diabetes uh, self-management, but their goals for adolescents were to be able to get their driver's license, to be able to attend college out of state, to be able to travel internationally for a school trip, right? There were different things outside of diabetes that were going to really motivate them to do the very best job that they could in um, uh, managing those blood sugars. Uh, so again, I think using upfront communication, uh, working with the person with diabetes on perceptions of their illness and their diagnosis, you know, again, being diagnosed at 13, that was a real pivotal, pivotal time for me um, when I was diagnosed. Uh, involve the patient in the self-management decisions regardless of age. So even, you know, when I was diagnosed at 13, when Will was diagnosed at five, my parents, even though maybe we weren't wizards at dosing up insulin back then, uh, they gave us uh, autonomy with picking what blood sugar machine we wanted. I remember back in the day, I, I picked this very cool purple, I actually still have it, this purple blood sugar meter. Uh, my parents would let us choose our medical ID alert bracelets. Again, just a way to involve um, us in the management, uh, even if we couldn't do everything at the time because of our young age. Uh, so taking time to build resiliency with the patient, Again, this is gonna be a tough disease and it really does not look like there's an expiration date for it. So how can we build resiliency with that patient? Involving all members of a person's family. Again, this is a family disease, especially if the person is an adolescent. So how can we include um, all members of that person's family? Um, so that again, that their uh, perspective, they're going to always look at that person in their family with empathy and compassion um, and be a real encourager. Uh, continue with educating yourself on diabetes and current research. So again, there's a lot of rapidly changing information with diabetes, just like any other disease, like I said earlier, um, and making sure that you're staying sort of on top of that. Um, speak about the elephant in the room. You know, my research showed, and, and I know this personally, uh, I've had a lot of negative comments made to me over the years about living with diabetes, about people's perceptions, uh, a lot of comments. Again, I'm a little bit more public uh, just with, uh, you know, the work that I do, but a lot of comments about my weight, about what people think that I eat, um, a lack of exercise that people think I do. I'd like to say it's none of your business, but, um, you know, people have these perceptions and, and they feel like they get to share. So again, trying to get trust in that person with diabetes so that they will open up because they are deeply, deeply hurtful uh, things. Uh, this was a great chart. I know it's kind of small. I don't, you know, you may be able to see it on the PowerPoint that you download. If you want me to print off or actually email you this chart, I'm more than happy to do that. 
Um, but this is looking at language, again, some of what Mrs. Dickinson really worked hard on. So instead of using like the word diabetic, which we used to always say, try saying person with diabetes, person living with diabetes. I like this chart because then it gives an explanation, right? Um, of, of why are we evolving to this new word? Uh, so instead of test blood sugars, check blood sugars, um, instead of saying prevent or prevention, saying reduce risk, um, instead of using victim or they suffer from diabetes, say live with diabetes, has diabetes, diagnosed with diabetes. But again, I find this a really helpful chart. Um, anticipating the patient's feelings. So, uh, you know, again, uh, motivational interviewing we know has been very effective in medical settings. Um, but using questions like, I'm guessing you must be overwhelmed and frustrated to have to do all of these things day after day. Is that accurate? My tuition tells me you feel defeated. Does that seem true? You seem to feel like you can't get this diabetes under control. Is that right? Um, so using things like this, I think, can really help facilitate those conversations with you and your patients and also you and a loved one um, as well. So again, really honing in on communication and also sort of the empathetic lens that you're using uh, to look at uh, the person with diabetes. Getting help. Um, so things, again, research has been done on what can really help with diabetes, burnout, diabetes, distress, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I know for me that has been very helpful over the years. It's what I find the most helpful personally. Uh, family therapy, again, especially if you have an adolescent. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Uh, lastly, medication. Um, so again, I know personally I, I am on Prozac. That really helps sort of even me out. I'm also on an anxiety medication, um, you know, just being fully transparent. Uh, those things have really helped me manage some of these extreme emotions. Um, you know, because again, living with diabetes is not a sprint. Uh, it is certainly a marathon uh, and you have to treat each day like that. So in in conclusion, um, I, I really liked this, this quote. Um, she says, the paradigm of diabetes care and education is moving past an approach that views the healthcare provider as the expert who tells people with diabetes what to do. It is moving toward an approach where people with diabetes are the central members of their care team, experts on their experiences and integral to the management of their disease. So again, you know, can we sort of evolve along as the years are going on, the more that we know. Um, and so I, I really liked the way that she um, put this. Uh, I really wanna thank you all um, for sitting through the presentation um uh, for for having open ears um to listen and uh there's a lot of things that come along with diabetes and so uh you know thank you for for listening to this thank you for the hard work you do every single day uh, to help people like myself and my brother uh, live our very best lives so uh with that i'm going to turn it over to tamara and i've left uh a couple minutes here uh for any questions that people may have i'd be happy to answer those Thank you, Quinn. We do have some questions, so I'll jump right in with those. Um, Roberta is asking, what do you mean by time in range? Will you explain that concept a little bit for those who don't know? Yeah, thank you, Roberta, for asking that question. So time in range is, so with the continuous glucose monitor, which is the sensor that I wear, uh, the Libre is also another CGM. Uh, it gives you your blood sugars every five minutes you are able to pull reports personally or your medical team that shows how many minutes of the day are you actually in range. So time and range would be how many minutes of the day am I between, let me just throw out a range, uh, everybody could be a little bit different, but 80 to 120. So how many minutes in the day has my blood sugar been between 80 and 120? So again, you're, you're looking for, you know, 70% just depends on the person. But instead of just looking at an A1C, because an A1C can sometimes come out as inaccurate. You could have an A1C of 6.5, which on paper looks great, but you may be having extreme low blood sugars that are actually quite dangerous for you. And so it's hard then when you're looking at sort of this average number over three months, 
the the community is shifting to looking at this time and range, which is excellent. I totally agree with that. But again, if somebody can't afford insulin, if they cannot afford basic food and shelter, how are they able to afford a CGM? And so for me personally, I felt the commercial uh, really missed an opportunity there uh, with recognizing only 3% globally can actually afford a CGM. Got it, thank you. Um, the next question is from Kathy and she just needs clarification about the number five question on the test, which is what percent of mental health conditions and cases of severe psychological distress, excuse me, distress, go undetected among people with diabetes? Yes, I will. Let me. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I, you know where to find it because I don't. So, or you'll be faster than I would. Yeah, let me uh, pull this back up. Um, so, it is estimated that only around one third of people with diabetes um, and mental health conditions will receive a diagnosis and proper treatment. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think it's okay. that one. Thank you. This next question is. Um, is lengthy, but it's great. It's asking some really good uh, things in between. So bear with me. So it's I can only see a little bit of it on my screen. So it'll take me a second to get to all of it. This is from Mary. And Mary says, thank you for your passion and advocacy. Do you recommend collecting data on diabetes burnout as part of a medical appointment? As a provider, how do I validate feelings the person with, with diabetes is having and yet provide hope some of the research as far as registered dietitians is concerned our clients are looking to us for positive expectations and motivation would what do you feel is missing from any experience or encounter with a registered dietitian great question mary so i've seen different <laughs> it's a lot there's a lot yeah. packed in there but it's great yeah, I'm going to do my very best to answer it. So, you know, I've seen a dietitian from the moment that I was diagnosed at 13, I was given a, a diabetes dietitian on my team. So I've seen quite a few over the years between having diabetes and then also later in life uh, with diabetes and having an eating disorder. Uh, when it comes to the dietitians I've had specifically with diabetes, um, again, I will say, and, and talking to other people with diabetes, there is a real hesitancy to go in sometimes to dietitian type appointments because you are so afraid um, that that fat shame, that fat phobia may be present, um, that people are going to shame you on, on what you've had to eat or your weight. And so I think being very clear, being very careful about the language that is used that, okay, I understand for people with type two diabetes, weight may be a factor. And so you are having to look at okay, putting them, um, trying to get them to do some healthier choices, right, to help with that. But again, I think normalizing things, being empathetic, asking some of those questions that I said at the end um, about, again, are, is healthy food options even available? Are financial barriers the problem, right? Um, are they able to afford those things? Or are they simply just struggling to afford insulin, which every person with type 1 diabetes absolutely needs? So uh, I think kind of looking at it at a, as a holistic approach for that patient, um, asking some of those motivational interviewing type questions, knowing that you may have to have some difficult conversations um, about choices that are being made. But for me, always giving that person with diabetes the benefit of the doubt. Again, they may be burnt out, they may be in great distress, but they've showed up at that appointment and that's a win. And so I think finding uh, my endocrinologist who I talked about, the quarterback and the coach, he always said to me, it is not hard for me to give a compliment to every single patient that walks through my doors. And he said, that is my goal at every single appointment. So if that is simply commending somebody for showing up, getting themselves to that appointment that day, that's how I believe that you should lead and it'll open up to a much more transparent conversation and relationship, I think, with most people. Wonderful, thank you. Linda Marie is asking, how can someone who's on Medicaid find a Libre, Libre glucometer as it's not covered by insurance? And she followed up by saying, I meant, is there a place where this person can get a free monitor? I just thought maybe you could address that in general. Are there some resources for folks who who maybe don't have great uh, financial resources? 
Yeah, so it's super unfortunate uh, with Medicaid, again, with a lot of other um, insurances, because I believe everybody who, well, I, I believe everybody with diabetes should be on a CGM because they are so incredible and they help save lives and really prevent so many complications. It's so, I could just pull out my hair at how frustrated I am at health insurance companies for not covering it. Um, I don't know as much about the Libre because my brother and I are on the Dexcom. Um, what I will say is you can go on the company's websites, maybe you've already done this, you can look to see if they have any patient assistance programs. I will specifically speak to Dexcom. They had a patient assistance program that they came out for COVID. Now, again, the caveat was you could not have health insurance, but my younger brother was actually between jobs, didn't have health insurance, was desperate for his sensors. So he was provided a 90 day supply for a, a, a pretty low cost um, by Dexcom. And so again, he went through the company's website. I sent him the link. Uh, you know, you have to do a little bit of paperwork. Um, I tried to do that actually during the pandemic before I was married. Um, I didn't qualify because I had health insurance. Um, so unfortunately, my other tip to people is the American Diabetes Association. You can call 1-800-DIABETES. It's a, a, free, uh, a free service. You can ask them saying, hey, I have a patient on Medicaid. We're trying to get them on a Libre or a Dexcom. What are resources that we can use? Or we're struggling to afford insulin. What are some resources that we can use? Um, and, and they can really point people in the right direction. They also, if you have a patient with diabetes who's being discriminated against in school, at work, uh, they have a whole legal advocacy division that will work for free for the people with diabetes. And it's an incredible resource. Uh, wow, no that's that's no. wonderful. I didn't know that. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, we have a couple more questions that I still would like to get to, but I recognize we're at the top of the hour. So I just want to give a couple of reminders for those folks who need to hop off. And then if you'd like to stay on and, and listen to Quinn answer a couple more questions, you're more than welcome. But I know lots of our folks on uh, line are providers and may have an appointment at the top of the hour. So let me make these two quick reminders. First of all, when I end the webinar here in a few minutes, uh, an evaluation will automatically pop up on your screen. When that happens, if you'd be so kind as to take just a minute to complete that, that would be really helpful. That's a continuing education requirement for Center for Change. Um, your information that you provide is completely anonymous, so please feel free to be candid in your feedback. We then tabulate those results and send those to the CE entities. So if you would do that for us, that'd be awesome. And then about an hour after we finish the webinar, you'll receive a separate email from GoToWebinar with the link to take the online test. Uh, you must uh, take the test online in, in order to receive continuing education credit. Once you pass the test online, your CE certificate will automatically be downloaded to your computer. So if you don't see it on your screen, check your downloads file. Okay, let's jump back into a couple more questions. And if you need to hop off, we totally understand. Mm -hmm. uh, this question is from Catherine Quinn, and it's and it's and she says, any thoughts around approaches to working with substance using clients and diabetes? I'm an LADC and I do come in contact with clients who have type one and type two. Yeah, so so talking specifically about the approach with those types of, okay. Yeah, with substance using clients and how that might be a little bit different. Yeah, so again, uh, I've talked to a, a lot of people with diabetes who also struggle with a substance use disorder, with drugs, alcohol. Um, what I will say I think is not helpful is if in that situation somebody will tell me just stop drinking it's really bad for your diabetes um most people with diabetes know that drinking alcohol or using drugs isn't really helpful so for somebody to sort of state the obvious you sort of feel defeated like okay i'm showing up to this appointment it shows a effort at least that they want to get more information or that they are seeking help which we know is a really brave and courageous thing to do and so i think not stating it that way but saying okay what are some small victories that you had this week what are some small things that we can do to to work towards our goals what are some goals that you would like to have around your substance use um, so again, so it's collaborative, it's it's involving them in their care. It's not saying you're a bad diabetic because you're drinking alcohol. You know, that stuff, and I'm sure you already know this, that doesn't help. And so again, 
figuring out how you can really open those lines of communication and also saying, I can not imagine how difficult it is to live with diabetes every single day, right? Because what I always say to people about substance use disorders is alcohol, for instance, helps a lot of people numb pain, numb anxiety, numb depression to check out. Is it a healthy coping strategy? Absolutely not. But has it been effective to some degree? Absolutely. So it's, I think, recognizing that for the person, not making them feel bad, that that was the outlet that they turned to to just simply keep themselves alive or keep themselves, you know, even though it seems dysfunctional. Um, and figuring out with that person what works for them to learn coping, co healthy coping strategies. So I hope that that's of help. Thank you. Uh, one more question, and then I'll uh, read a comment, and then we'll we'll uh, be finished. Um, the question, this is from Emily. How would you suggest approaching a patient that is convinced of inaccurate information and is interpreting their experience with wrong conclusions while still being respectful so they are, so they are ready to change how they are thinking? And in parentheses, Emily says, I'm a diabetes educator. Got it. So, um, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know the specific situation you're talking about, but if somebody has sort of an altered view of reality in general, I do think the role as a diabetes educator is to do your best to reel that in. And again, like one of the tips, you know, that I said at the end, dealing with facts, um, with, with health-based information and facts, I think is going to be crucial. So either, you know, looking at an A1C, if somebody doesn't have a CGM, somebody has a CGM, it's great because you can look at that. Also, um, I, I think saying, to a patient, you want them to be as open and honest as possible so that you can be the most helpful in your job, right? Maybe talking to them about being a coach, that you're the coach and they're the quarterback and that you recognize that they're going to be the ones calling the shots when, when you're no longer at that appointment um, and, and recognizing that. Um, because again, you can only be so helpful as they are to be honest. And so I, I think trying to find ways that you can come to agreements on certain things um, that you could collaboratively make goals together, even if those are so teeny and minute and, and micro, um, little things like that. Um, because again, that person may have an altered sense of reality, maybe because they have been shamed in, in previous appointments with other providers or they have an unhealthy, um, who knows, maybe abusive home life, and there's a reason why they are not being completely truthful or not recognizing reality. Um, so, so being very careful and, and cautious with that and, and just seeing what can you agree on and what small little goals uh, you can work on together. So Thank thanks you. for your Good, good no. advice. Great, good advice. The last is a comment. This is from Bobette. Thank you, Quinn, for being so transparent and sharing your knowledge and experience living with diabetes. Your sharing has made a significant change in my thinking and attitude about persons living with diabetes, and I will view and treat them differently, in parentheses, better. I admire your passion, quest for knowledge, and willingness to share so openly to help other people. Mm, thank you very much. That means a lot. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We hope you can be with us. We have a ton of webinars in August. We have another one next week. Jessica Satnick, who's an awesome dietitian, is going to be presenting on the uh, the anthropology of eating. I've, I've heard this presentation, it's phenomenal. So that's Tuesday, August 24th at noon mountain time. We hope you all can join us. And in the meantime, everybody take good care and be well. Bye. Bye.